Welcome everyone to uh, MIT Chinese Alumni Group. This is a um, co-hosted um, webinar between Shanghai, New York, and of course, everyone all remote around the world. Um, so I think format wise, this was originally gonna be a one hour session. Um, we have adjusted it to, to be up to one and a half hour. So if folks need to leave at the one hour mark, they, they are welcome to do so. But uh, Peggy has generously um, expanded the, the time allocation to allow for a more free form conversation uh, after her 40 minute talk. And then there will be open Q and A and this session is also unique because it's our first MIT joint event with Clubhouse. And so uh, there is also a live concurrent uh, Clubhouse session that's actually being run. They are audio only and uh, we, we are video and audio. Um, so with that, let me go ahead and uh, introduce you, Peggy. Uh, Peggy Liu is also known as the green goddess of China per the Global Times, a shaper of US-China relations. The, cha the chairman of the IPCC, a Nobel laureate, has publicly stated that what we need is 100 Peggy Lu's all over the world. If that were to happen, then we would be on the path to a sustainable society. Today, today we get to hear Peggy's theory on enabling societal scale change for a better world, which draws from her on the ground successes in China and her awareness of how reality is shaped the expert spiritual quantum manifestation constructs. With that, uh, Peggy is a MIT class of 90 graduate, same year as me, and it's my pleasure and honor to introduce you, Peggy. 1990, Humphrey, yes. <laughs> I still have the picture of us with our uh, reunion. Our like, giant brass uh, rat. Yeah, brass rat, paperweights. <laughs> If you remember that, I will, I will dig that up um, over your talk and show that with, later with everybody. <laughs> okay. All right, definitely. Well, um, thank you everybody for having me here. It's always good to speak at MIT, honestly. It's my um, dream school. It was my dream school since I was seventh grade, literally. I was like, wow, I really, really just want to go to MIT and build robots. So, Thankfully, that dream has happened, it has manifested, and now there are robots everywhere. I was able to invest in some robot companies, and I want to tell you my story about what has happened since MIT, but I'm going to limit my scope to specifically my career as an environmentalist in China. But first, for those of you who are here from MIT, I wanted to ask you if you remember what the first time was, that first flash, when you said, I have to go to MIT, because I had a really strong moment when I was at Chinese family camp. And this was somewhere in New, Zealand, New, New England, I can't remember exactly where, but it was somewhere there. And I remember very clearly, it was really fun. The first time I went, I went to the edge of a pond, and there was a girl standing there. I think she was she was maybe a camp counselor and she was wearing a t-shirt. She was wearing a burgundy t-shirt. You know what I mean? It was an MIT t-shirt and this girl's name was Greer Tan. And when I saw this MIT t-shirt, I had this realization that girls could go to MIT. You know, this. remember I'm class of 1990, so this was a little bit unusual, but seeing this girl wear an MIT t-shirt made me realize that girls going to MIT was possible. And ever since that moment in seventh grade, I knew for sure that I wanted to go to MIT. Thank God I got in because I don't know what I would have done if I didn't get in. But at that moment, I remember there were very few women that were going to MIT. Since then, I remember there was a jump to 20% women. And now I think it's 50% women. And that is, I mean, the, the Institute must be a completely different place at this point. I didn't realize what a gift this moment was until I recently heard the story of Roger Bannister. I don't know if you know the, who this guy is, but he was, he ran a four minute mile and he didn't listen to critics when they told him that nobody could run a four minute mile. They said it wasn't possible, it was impossible. 
And what did he do? He ignored them. And he busted through this limit to become the first person to break the four minute mile. And the interesting thing was that once other people saw that this was possible, a lot of people started to run a four minute mile as well. They stopped imposing someone else's beliefs on themselves, other people's limiting beliefs, societal beliefs. Instead, they started to imagine larger, more audacious possibilities. So imagination was the key to Bannister's achieving a new reality. Seeing Greer Tan in her MIT burgundy t-shirt gave me the permission to remove these limiting beliefs that society places on us. And it taught me that we're only constrained by the limits of our own imagination. And I would use this gift over and over again in life. As I helped pioneer e-commerce in Silicon Valley, as I pioneered clean energy and eco cities and smart grid and sustainable diets in the China dream in China. I'm Peggy Liu. I'm a proud member of class of 1990 at MIT. Course 6-3, next, next house resident. So for those of you who are not from MIT, let me explain that. <laughs> Course 6-3 means I majored in electrical engineering and computer science. And next house at the time was the next new house, next to new house. And of course, as a Chinese person, I like the newest house. So I decided I want to live there like a lot of other Chinese people. <laughs> and of course, it was the farthest from campus, the center of campus, and the farthest from Sloan School you can get. So I think the one thing that I took away from living at MIT and Next House was, and I told my kids this, please don't pick the furthest dorm from the center of campus <laughs> because it forces you to skip a lot of classes in snowstorms. But anyway, that, that is my little brief story at MIT, class 1990, course 63 at Next House. As chairperson of JUICE since 2007, I've been at the heart of the greening of China for over a decade. And I've been a catalyst for societal scale change. I sit in the intersection between personal and planetary health. That is almost a decade and a half, which is quite a long time. And it's definitely been, I, I can't, describe it in any other way than say it's been a wild journey. It's something that I could not have imagined when I founded JUICE. When I started JUICE in 2007, there was one advisor who said that people are gonna tell you, Peggy, that tackling climate change across China is an insurmountable challenge. Just ignore them. So he did. And JUICE has now succeeded in changing the course of China six times over. So I wanna tell you a little bit about my story. When I was younger, I was a very lonely kid. I was a first born American to immigrant Chinese parents. I think like a lot of MIT Chinese American students. And I faced a lot of racist bullying in school, no lie. I didn't go out, I didn't have a lot of friends. And so I turned to sci-fi, a lot of sci-fi. I would sit under the covers with a flashlight at night reading sci-fi and sci-fi to me was magical because it showed me how technology can change the world. In fact, one person can change the entire universe. Just look at Ender's Game or Dune, and if I could just build robots like the ones in The Foundation by Isaac Asimov, I could better people's lives around the world. Now I'm gonna ask everybody who went to MIT or college anywhere, do you remember 
what your application question was when you applied to school. If you're class of 1990, do you remember what that application question was? Because I do. Who would you like to meet, living or dead? And I said, Isaac Asimov. And how many of you in class of 1990 or maybe class of 1986 to 1990, how many of you were with me in Kresge Auditorium when Isaac Asimov came to speak our freshman year? To me, it was a sign from the universe that I was on the right path. I'm not, I'm not exaggerating. I, it was a sign from the universe. It was a sign that I was home. And after his speech, I rushed up to tell him that he was the one who inspired me to study EECS, electrical engineering, computer science, so that I could build robots one day, just like in the foundation. I was super, super excited when I saw him and he was like, would you like me to sign something for you? I was like, ah, oh, I rushed up and I have nothing for you to sign. And his wife is standing there and he's sitting there and he goes, that's okay. I sign body parts too. <laughs> so I was like, oh, this guy, this guy's very funny. And I was just like, ah, oh, my, my dream has come true. The next, next year, unfortunately, he passed away. So I know it was a sign from the universe that I was meant to go to MIT and use technology to change the world, to change the universe. I remember one specific MIT classic moment of many, many, many moments that I've had with MIT that literally changed the entire trajectory of my life. And that was in 2006. I was living in Shanghai already, and I was an officer of the MIT Club of Shanghai. And Susan Hochfeld stopped here on her first international tour as president of MIT. And she declared that she was going to cluster the siloed disciplines at MIT around life sciences and clean energy, because that was where MIT could contribute the most to society. And these are multidisciplinary endeavors. They can't just be silos. So she was really smart. She was very collaborative. And today you still see her effect on MIT. I was inspired after speech to produce the MIT Forum on the Future of Energy in China in April of 2007. This wasn't that easy. I thought it was gonna be easy. I thought I was you know, throwing together a party of venture capitalists in Silicon Valley where I just moved from and a venture capitalist in Shanghai where I was a VC. And I thought I'd just have a big party and call it the first world's class clean tech investors conference in China. But it accidentally became the first public dialogues between US and Chinese government officials on clean energy. And it was surprising to me that it was the first time for this to happen. It was even more surprising for me in the private dialogues behind the scenes to hear both governments say that there were 60 memorandums of understanding between the two countries to collaborate, but nothing tangible to show for it because they needed more help to facilitate programmatic collaboration between the two countries on the ground in China. They needed to learn how to bridge the two different cultures. They had no idea how. So 60 MOUs, nothing tangible to show for it. The 400 attendees of the MIT Forum on the Future of Energy in China, including Bob Armstrong, who was the head of the MIT Energy Initiative and still is, all encouraged me not to stop at just one event. So out of this, JUICE, my organization JUICE, or Joint US-China Collaboration on Clean Energy was born. The none of this historic moment was part of a grand 
plan. This was very important. It took me just one day to decide to change my career with a little bit of a persuasive help from the guy who was working with George Bush at the time, Steve Papermaster. He was very persuasive and he's like, Peggy, you really, really should listen to everybody and do this. We need you to do this. But literally in one day, I decided to leave my job as a VC and commit 10 years of my life to combating climate change in the biggest polluting country in the world. So you might be like, whoa, <laughs> what were you thinking? But it was just a calling and I couldn't say no. This one day started my journey to become what press quickly dubbed me as China's green goddess. The Global Times did this two page spread of me with China's green goddess and this just stuck. And that moment, I decided to found Juice, and every moment after, I listened to my gut. And I jumped in, magnetizing people to this mission of changing the way people in China created and used energy. And I energized movement after movement. This word is very important. I energized movement after movement. I didn't lead them, I energized them. Now in hindsight, I've learned that I needed to truly follow my heart and gut to make decisions and rely on my MIT engineering discipline to execute these decisions. And this is also something that I think really differentiates me from a lot of other people doing societal scale change. So I'm going to, before we end, tell you some of these secrets that I've learned. When people ask me, what did, what did you learn at MIT that you actually use today? I'm sure you get this question a lot. I tell them that after founding JUICE, the head of the energy committee at the US President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology under George W. Bush, encouraged me to introduce the concept of smart grid into China. Now, a lot of people don't know what that means, but it's a little bit like if Martians dropped internet on top of rotary phones. That's how different it is for the grid, the electrical grid. And at the time, the term wasn't even used in China. They never heard of it. They were focused on ultra high voltage transmission lines, which they still are. And I remember how I approached this problem. I remember writing a very simple white paper, drawing out what smart grid was with a little picture, with you know little icons, including this little cute electric vehicle as energy storage. And the China state grid looked at that electric vehicle in May 2007, and they said, electric vehicles, that seems too futuristic. Maybe you should come back in 10 years. Of course, China has become the leader in electric vehicles way before 2007. So at that time, luckily, I persisted, maybe out of naivete, <laughs> maybe out of this was the first product project and I better do something. So I was able to somehow at different points draw in the CEO of Duke Energy, the largest utility in the US and the US Department of Energy, eventually VPs of Cisco, VPs of IBM and other companies at the time, the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. But the initial start with the CEO of Duke Energy was to make a commitment at the Clinton Global Initiative to hold three smart grid forums on the ground in China to show how would smart grid benefit China from this little picture in this little white paper, it started. And within two and a half years, JUICE revolutionized, there is no better word for this, but JUICE revolutionized the direction of China's entire electrical grid system. And today, China is now the leader in smart grid in the world. There are now over 500 smart city pilots across the country. Now, part of this is because China only has two grid companies, the China State Grid and the China Southern Grid. And the China State Grid that I focused on 
covers 80% of the landmass. And at the time, there was only one department that looked at new technologies, SEPRI. And of SEPRI, that one department, only two people looked or talked to foreigners. So surrounding these two people with solutions and collaborative nature and on the ground dialogue led to a revolution of the entire country's grid. I call this an acupuncture point. Finding that acupuncture point is really key to scaling change at societal scale. Luckily, it's a little bit easier to do that in China and easier to do it in infrastructure than consumer demand. So looking back in how we accomplished this in a short period of three years, there's many things that happened as a ripple effect in building this tornado, right? It wasn't just the $7.2 billion that the state grid put behind implementing smart grid by 2020. I also got Yangzhou, Jiang Zemin's hometown to within nine months, I was cutting the ribbon within nine months of 200 mu, which I think is something like 12 acres, 200 mu new smart grid demonstration hub that was the first of many, many city level smart grid pilots. So there's one Goliath and one David. Again, this audacious vision started with a picture of what the future looks like. So remember, remember I said that because I'm gonna say that over and over again. Now, when I speak around the world as a window into China's green journey in different countries, I use this smart grid as one example of how China has been going through gigascale change at gigapace. And I tell people that China is a new country every five years. My entire block right now is under construction. And within, I'm going to say, a few months, I'm going to have a completely different landscape all around me. And I'm talking about months, not years. The entire block is under construction. And now COVID-19 has thrown the entire world into a massive roller coaster of change. I think this pace of change is accelerating. I know that you can feel this too. And I believe that humanity will be facing radical changes over the next four, if not eight years. And President Reif of MIT, in an email to MITers during COVID start, called MIT a community with an essential commitment to work together to address humanity's greatest challenges. And I say that dealing with this rapidly accelerating gigascale change, whether from COVID or climate change, is humanity's greatest challenge, is dealing with change. Change is the only constant we can count on now. You know, entropy, the only constant. So get comfortable with not being attached to anything, to anyone, any self anymore. Resilient people will not be constrained by any traditional limiting images of success. Resilient people will use their curiosity and their sense of wonder to imagine into being whole new ways of life. Resilient people will use their gut and not just their brain to help them get there. I see an opportunity for jobs that help people deal with this change in personal relationships, in health, in mental state, jobs that focus on compassion, on creativity, on connectivity are the ones that are really going to make a difference in people's lives. And ironically for me, differentiate us from robots. 
One of the most astounding successes of my organization, JUICE, was when we started a countrywide series of conversations to retell the story of sustainability by reimagining prosperity. And this led to the national slogan, China Dream, on billboards everywhere, literally everywhere. I once asked my nanny when I was first starting this China Dream initiative, her name's Tui Fengqing, and she must be over 65 now. I'm, I'm really bad with ages, but I'm pretty sure she's over 65. I asked her, what is her dream? What was her dream when she was younger? And you know, she was part of a generation that was sent from the urban setting of Shanghai during the Cultural Revolution to a faraway rural village to plant rice for seven whole years. And she didn't go to school, so she tried to read to educate herself, but she wasn't that literate, so she educated herself how to read. And there was famine across the country. And once a year, the government would come by and give each household frozen eggs so they can make egg dumplings to celebrate the Chinese New Year. And when I asked her, what was your dream when you were younger? She said, she didn't even have one. She didn't dare to have a dream because they were worried day to day about survival. So in 2010, I started to lead with the help of several advertising agencies, the global creative director of Sachin Sachi S, the head of Ogilvy Green here, the CEO of Edelman China, they all helped me to create a series of conversations on what prosperity looked like. And for me, crafting these China dream conversations meant giving permission to everyone that they could have a dream. And we asked them to reimagine, to ignite their imagination, to give themselves permission to paint a world that was filled with joy. And I learned that to change people's behavior, we have to stop speaking to people's heads and speak to people's hearts. This was so hard to do as somebody who graduated from electrical engineering and computer science from MIT. But we focused people's attention not on what we didn't want in our lives, what doomsday scenario there was, Instead, we focused on creating a new love story between people and planet. I call this storytelling for a purpose where imagination becomes reality. Storytelling for a purpose. This was one of my biggest lessons that I started to talk about worldwide in 2010. So you start to see a shift in places like Marks and Spencer and World Economic Forum, The Guardian, uh, and these leaders started to talk about storytelling. So to lead the China Dream Initiative in this direction, as an MIT graduate with electrical engineering, computer science brain, I had to make a tremendous shift in myself to open up to my own emotions. And I don't know about you, but this was very, very difficult for me as somebody who did not grow up with permission to express emotions. And so my greatest learning is that to transform the world, we must first transform ourselves. And I know you hear this from many, many different people, but it's true. My greatest learning is that to transform the world, we must first transform ourselves. We need to remove the barriers that separate us from one another. We need to connect through our hearts and not just our minds. This is the power to societal scale change. It's one thing to create groundbreaking technologies and get Nobel prizes at MIT. It's another to scale the implementation at city level, at province level, at country level, at world level. So although I went to MIT to search for new technologies, to create new technologies to change the world, now I realize that the true 
technology is my heart. The true technology is my heart. Now I'll tell you a couple stories from my MIT days that were just larger than life. One person that I met at MIT after I graduated, when I was serving at the MIT CDC, sort of like the board of MIT, one of the people that I met was Bob Metcalf. Bob freaking Metcalf invented the ethernet. The ethernet is the way that computers connect to each other on the internet. He invented it in 1973. And I remember exactly the moment that I met him. We were sitting at dinner together after an MIT CDC meeting and his energy, his energy field literally seemed to extend beyond him. If you've met him before, you know he's a really big man with a really big smile, sort of a big head and a booming voice. And literally his energy field just filled up the entire room, way beyond the round table that we're sitting at. And I remember he was saying, oh, he was class of 1968. And I excitedly, in trying to connect to him, I said, hey, I was born in 1968. <laughs> I remember one of the MIT executives frowned at me, like silently in the corner of my eye, I saw this. I, I think he thought it was impolite, but Bob, Bob Metcalf, he just laughed. And he smiled this huge smile. And I knew at that moment that we were going to be good friends. And he later asked me to join the board of the MIT Technology Review Magazine. And you may have seen this magazine on stands. It's a great magazine. I'm really proud of being on the board. And he, I had the pleasure of working together with him to make the magazine independently governed. So we broke it off from MIT. And that's why you see it quite successfully on stands, magazine stands around the world. So that's my, one of my famous MIT stories. My second MIT story, MIT personality story, was meeting Steve Kirsch. And Steve Kirsch was the inventor of the optical mouse and the founder of InfoSeq. And I know that's dating me, but he's the founder of InfoSeq. And we worked together on an MIT fundraiser. And Bob Metcalf agreed to be there along with then President Chuck Vest. I've worked for, for five different presidents of MIT and he was one of them. And Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin. <laughs> there were like amazing, amazing people from MIT there. It was incredible. And this was in Silicon Valley. And oh my God, I was sitting there with this collection of alumni and being in utter awe of the legacy this group was leaving behind. Hello, Buzz Aldrin, second guy on the moon. And Steve Kirsch and I were later talking about what we wished we had the chance to learn at MIT. There's a lot of stuff we learned at MIT. It's called a fire hose for a reason, but there's still some things that we wish we had learned. He said, I wish I had learned sales techniques. And I said, I wish we had learned to connect as human beings. And I told him this story that this, at the start of my freshman year, this is a true freaking story. A few guys and I were hanging out late at night, as we do, on some steps in a stairwell. We're getting to know each other. And one guy asked, I remember being the only girl there. One guy asked me, are girls really as complicated as quirks? I swear to God, he said that. Are girls really as complicated as quirks? So needless to say, many years after I graduated with Steve Kirsch, after this discussion, this led me to write a business plan for an extracurricular program that I codenamed Charm School. And Steve Kirsch then took it to the MIT, somebody or others, and he pushed it into existence. So somebody at MIT decided this was actually a good idea. I wrote this in 24 hours. I thought we were going to edit it. I thought we were going to have some sort of discussion. I thought we were going to rename it when implemented, but no, it wasn't renamed. It's still called Charm School. And I remember years later reading a Boston newspaper article on the fact that Charm School was still taking place every January during IAP. And there was lots of things that you can learn about how to socialize, including how to tie a tie. 
So those were some really fun stories at MIT. And I think that the legacy from those experiences was not that I created some brilliant technology like the ethernet, you know, I didn't, I worked on ISDN, which isn't even around anymore, ISDN networking, again, dating myself. Um, you know, I didn't win a Nobel prize, but the technology that my legacy was on MIT, I think is about connecting people heart to heart. So if I were to look back on the day that I entered MIT in 1986, I would tell myself the secrets that I know now after shaping China six times over, which really shaping China is shaping the world, I would tell myself these secrets. One person at a time changes the world. I would say to myself, focus all your energy and all your imagination on the world as you want it to be in the future. Stop worrying about all the reasons why you won't succeed, all the barriers that people tell you that you have, why it's an insurmountable challenge, all the three doomsday scenarios, all the fear-based scenarios of what would happen if we don't succeed. Literally throw that all away and single-mindedly focus on the world that you want as if it were real now in such great detail that you can step into it like you were to step into an avatar world today, at this moment, at this now. And I would say to myself that to create the world you want starts with your own imagination. And what happens is you magnetize like-hearted people to dream with you, to act as one together. So you're breathing life into a tornado. You're a launching pad for a tornado, your one person's imagination breathes life into a tornado. And then you build this tornado as you magnetize more people into this dream with you. And they all move in the same direction at the same speed with the same resonance, or they just go to the wayside. But all these people then build the tornado speed and they increase the angular momentum as you have little milestones of success, like the smart grid, like catalyzing clean energy across China in 2007, like starting the first ever eco city classes in China and teaching a thousand mayors across China how to build eco cities, like changing the lighting codes in new buildings to go from incandescence to energy efficient lighting. Like having China Dream Initiative become the national slogan. Like starting Food Heroes curriculum and having the whole diet of China start to adopt plant-based diets, eating a rainbow every day and starting to sort wet waste so that we can reduce food waste and to have the empty plate campaign help reduce food waste even further. These milestones create this tornado effect, this vortex that allows you to take a quantum leap into the future that you have imagined. Not a linear business plan, not even an S curve as they teach you in Silicon Valley to cross the chasm. No, that's not fast enough. We need radical change, not incremental change. We need tornado leaders, and it only takes one person. So I would say to myself, when you feel powerless and swept away by the seas of change and COVID, remember that every single human being has the extraordinary power to create because you have the extraordinary power to dream. You have the extraordinary power to imagine. And of course, as MIT people, we have the extraordinary power to plan and execute. So combine those in one and you will change the world. So I would say to myself at every now moment, you are unintentionally creating the world you live in and where you focus your attention is the intention that creates your world.
where you focus your attention on breathing life into this tornado. That is the intention that creates your world. It's the launching pad to societal scale change. Now your mind doesn't remember this, but your heart does. I would say to myself that now you know that you have the power to shape the world, you have the responsibility to create good ones. And that's my story, at least the last decade and a half. I have many, many decades in me of work, but hopefully that gives you an idea of how you start and how you navigate societal scale change. It's not by leading, not by controlling, not by a pyramid of old organizational management, but instead the top of the hourglass of the hourglass of time is a tornado. It's a living, flowing, dynamic, upward spiral. That is the key to the harmonics of quantum change, the harmonics of the universe, that all of us are creators of our own universe. And with that, I'm Peggy Liu, MIT, 1990, course 6-3, Electrical Engineering Computer Science, proud resident of Next House. And I would love to hear from you and take some questions. And I'll also open it up to my friends on Clubhouse. Cool. Awesome. By the way, I, I, I found I was able to find the little picture of us um, to just start it off before we opened up into Q&A. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah, that's exactly the picture. Isn't that a great picture? That, that, that is our 25 year reunion. And that's oh the giant reunion. paperweight. Um, uh, I have it. That we it's got. right behind me. Like, I should have I should have gotten it. Unfortunately, I lost my ring, so that's that's all I have is a brass rat. So you, you can really uh, hurt someone with that big giant one. <laughs> yeah. So the brass rat is the beaver. That's our mascot because the beaver works diligently and at night. So that yeah. certainly drives me. Totally. So like maybe I'll I'll start with like a, a, a few questions before we like you know while people are thinking of and and brewing them up. Um, so I noticed how you like really lit up when you were talking about. The high tech paparazzi that you met, Metcalf, Kirsch, mm -hmm. Aldrin, Isaac Asimov, <laughs> Asimov, of course, of course. That's Aldrin. Um, I'm curious to know, like, who have you, who do you want to meet that you have not met yet? Oh gosh, darn it, Humphrey! You should have asked me these questions before. So I <laughs> Sorry. Um, that's Don't such worry. a hard question because you know the the problem is is that I love meeting people right? Because the whole technology is heart to heart connections. Yeah. And so I really get off on meeting people and touching people's hearts. And I really believe that every single person has superpowers, every single person. And most people don't realize that they have superpowers. So my gift in part is helping people realize what their superpowers are. I somehow am able to find that out really quickly. That's always been something well, and, and, and when you combine that with being able to find like that acupuncture moment to like catalyze like a movement, that's like really powerful when you can harness superpowers, help people find their superpowers, and then identify those acupuncture moments to like launch major initiatives yeah. like, like you've already done so far. Yes, yes. So let me just repeat, acupuncture points are where, you know, the, the key leverage points that have massive ripple effects. So try to identify those, especially in infrastructure. Two is storytelling for a purpose. And then three is um, this tornado effect that everybody can launch a tornado and be a creator. Now, I'm, I'm curious if you have this list of things that you're imagining that you just don't have enough hours in the day to actually make happen that you actually are publishing anywhere that people could actually latch onto and make happen for you. <laughs> and I'm publishing? Well, um, no, not as an easy checklist, but if people go onto Facebook, my blog, Shanghai Peggy, is where I sort of have a diary. Hmm. And, um, you know, my real belief is, is that we are beings of infinite realities. Hmm. So at any now moment, there are infinite number of realities available to us. 
And all we have to do is literally launch the tornado with our imagination, our desire to think, right? Quantum physics, mm. right? You think about it, you observe it and boom, it exists. So there are infinite number of realities as potential energy, potential realities. And just by thinking it, it turns into kinetic energy, into a boulder that's rolling down the hill versus sitting on top of the hill. And so all you have to do to give momentum to a particular reality is to breathe as much life into it as possible, as much detail as possible, so that you know what you're wearing at the beginning of the day, what you're eating that day, how you're commuting to work, what your kids look like, um, you know, what they're squabbling about or being joyful about, uh, what restaurants are near you, how you um, make love, how do you, you know, what does the nature look like around you? Like literally, that is the momentum that creates the reality, those details in your imagination. Is that is that what you refer to as quantum manifestation or is that something different? That's part of it. That's, that's what I call law of availability, hmm. that everything is available to you at any now moment. And if you understand the secret that all you have to do is imagine the future as if it were real today in this now moment, because it already is, it already is, right? And then you imagine it with such joy. It's like, you know, James Cameron pictured the avatar world with such joy mm -hmm. that the protagonist didn't want to go back to his, you know, pod in his reality. He just wanted to stay there because it was so joyous. And it also affected us in this other universe, the moviegoers, the observers, right? It became the best watched movie of all time at that time. Yep. And so this is the secret to creating reality. Got it. Pretty so simple. James, <laughs> of course. Um, yeah, I mean, when you were mentioning that, it made me, like in Amazon, we always work and thought about like working backwards, which is nowhere near as eloquent as what you're describing as like a vision to imagine and, and work towards. Um, but James Wang is asking like, if you could talk a bit more about quantum manifestation as the first question. Yeah, well, when I teach this, the first thing that I tell people is everything is energy. And I, you know, as an electrical engineer, computer science major, um, when I was taking 6001, which is like the first class, uh, we had these Hewlett Packard oscilloscopes. I don't know if they still use these. I mean, on, honestly, like there's so many things that I think back that I did that are so like obsolete. Like we, um, were you six, were you six one Humphrey? No, I can't no, remember. No. Okay. No. Well, the first thing that you do is um, you wire together a computer in this class, but they literally give you capacitors to create this computer. And like now in the digital world, I, I, I mean, I don't know what the, what they do in 6001 now to create a computer, but the first thing you do is you you use this oscilloscope, right, as a way to test whether or not the computer circuits are, you know, connecting. And you see these waves, and there's little dials, and it, you know, and you can see it. it's a little bit like a heart monitor. Let me just say it's a heart monitor, but it was really fun. And for some reason, I was really fascinated by the dial and seeing these waves change. And I think it's because when I was in MIT around this time, my father introduced me to a man who had come from Shanghai to the US and he was the grand master of a Qigong practice, an energetic practice called the South Shaolin Inner Energy One Finger Zen Qigong practice. Mm. And he was the 19th generation Qigong master. I'm a 20th generation practitioner. And he taught me in these last 30 years, he taught me that you can feel energy between people from a distance. Mm. And I now, um, since 2017, I got permission to show this around the world. So I've been at like the Economist Innovation Summit with the deputy editor of Economist and the US business editor who are like MIT, Oxford, electrical engineer trained skeptics. And I showed them this and they're like, wow, we feel something. We don't know what it is. We can't explain it, but it's definitely tangible. So they were curious, it opened up their eyes that there's a different force that's an electromagnetic thermal force between human beings. And actually mm -hmm. this type of energy is across everything. And really all of us are only energy waves mm -hmm. and reality is only an energy field. And in fact, time is just part of this energy field. And so you can calculate at any moment in a reality by calculating this energy field, mm. time, space, 
you know, is not longitude latitude. Right. And yeah. so that's like the first thing that you need to know. And the way to get there is to let people feel physically this energy between your hands. So this is what I do around the world as a start to teaching quantum manifestation. So is that, is that what you felt with, with, uh, with Metcalf? You felt that whole, he had, he was exuding that whole energy around you or you, or was that an aura? Yeah. yeah. I mean, so if anybody is interested in public speaking, and this idea of charisma, I know that people at MIT, a lot of us are not the most biggest extroverts. I wasn't a natural extrovert. In fact, somebody who has just, uh, you know, just met me, he said, you know what? It's interesting. You're an introvert who likes to also be an extrovert. And this is because as a kid, I told you, I didn't have any friends, right? All I did was I had my sci-fi books under my bed sheets and so I From, wrote a book. Um, INTJ to ENTJ. <laughs> I, don't, I don't remember all those letters, but yeah, I mean, I, so I'm, my gift to everybody now is this book that I wrote called Mesmerize the Media. And it's um, on my website, juice.org slash mesmerize the media, or just go to the homepage and look for the book. And it is freely downloadable for all of you. It's an exercise book, workbook, and it's filled with stories of people that I help train at the World Economic Forum. And it's, um, it, it will change your idea that people are born with charisma. It's not true. It, charisma is just how you move your dynamic, your energy and change the dynamics of the energy field in a room. Mm. So if you're an electrical engineer like me, then that makes a lot of sense, right? Yeah. It's just much more neutral. And it's like from an observer point of view, you're just looking at the room, like a bunch of energy waves and you're like, okay, I need to be the dominant energy pusher, so to speak, right? And they are the receivers. And then I need to harmonize the energy waves so that I get everybody on the same wavelength, right? So to speak as me. But if you have somebody who's like, you know, opposite, frequency than as electrical engineer or anybody who knows waves forms know the amplitudes instead of adding up one plus one equals two then they cancel each other out so you have instead of a tsunami in an ocean wave you have a standing bathtub mm. and so this is the secret to charisma this is the secret <laughs> to changing the world is dominant that, energy that, that's awesome it's how fine. you've like um turned a, 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 a qualitative attribute into a quantifiable engineering state. <laughs> well, so actually emotions are also energy in motion. Hmm. Okay. So all chaotic, ang anxious, anxiety, you know, all that stuff, um, anger, it's just a waveform. Yeah. And so when you are able to remove yourself and observe that compassionately, and then you engage in the energy field, but you look at it very neutrally, then honestly, it opens up a whole nother world to you to look at reality. Yeah, no, it's Matrix. awesome. It's, it's, it's an awesome frame of mind to, to think about because like, if you think about your ability to influence and change someone's view based on that energy force, then it, it it's actually quite quite powerful. I mean, I, 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 I had never internalized this, but I, I, I'm actually going to relay from Esteban that, you know, he, he has many, many questions, but he's still processing what you said because you actually came at the perfect right time for him. So he, yeah, he wants to like personally, you know, relay his thanks, um, which uh, that sounds thanks, like- Thanks, uh, Esteban. You know what? <laughs> That's the way the universe works, right? Some people say there's nothing by accident, but what what's happening is, people are called into this room because of the energy of this room is the tornado, mm. right? And so people who stay in this room on the Zoom call in Clubhouse, they're staying in this room because they are aligned with the way that the tornado is going in the same direction, in the same speed, at the same resonance. And they're going, you know, they're increasing their angular momentum at the same speed as this upward spiral, mm. right? For people who like quantum physics or manifestation is a toroid for people who don't it's a donut it's a donut and the center of the toroid is a tornado right it goes up and then it goes around it's like a cloud that goes around the sides of the donut the tor toroid toroidal field and this is the the essence of um 
a creation, right? The white hole and the black hole. So anyway, many, That's many awesome. different So I have another Here question from Jim before we open it up to the club, clubhouse side. Um, Jim wanted to know how effective was advertising in helping to promote societal change and, and how was it paid for? So um, we paid for zero advertising, hmm. um, but we advertised. So because I was a distinguished professor at the China Academy of Governance and also a lecturer at the National Academy of uh, Mayors in China and the China Executive Leadership Academy of Pudong teaching how to build eco cities to mayors, um, I was asked to do monthly four page spreads on best practices in cities in a government magazine. And so they gave me for free on top of that two pages to do advertisements that I could do anything I wanted and when I was doing the China Dream Initiative, I basically had pictures from the workshops that we did of what the dream looked like for people and the words. And I would evolve this as we were doing more and more workshops, but I literally put the future into the hands of government in these magazines. And then I would work with companies like, um, you know, Dove, right, Watson's, L'Oreal, et cetera, and Citibank and GE and Philips. And they would then put in their works, in their companies, products, these concepts. So for example, um, L'Oreal worked with me to do a gift with purchase where we put a free uh, light bulb, energy efficient light bulb. And this was, this led, I mean, they were one, one part of the people that led to the building codes for all new buildings to change from incandescence to energy efficient lighting. This was because of a dream of the future. Mm -hmm. It just started with a dream. And you know their contribution into the tornado was a gift with purchase <laughs> that had all these magazine, you know, these, this language of the China dream with Du Juan, who is the China's first top supermodel, one of our ambassadors. Right, wow, that's awesome. So how about we op want to open it up to the clubhouse side? Yes. Absolutely. So um, I'm just going to let anybody who wants to come up and ask questions from Clubhouse, you're welcome to come up. I'm going to invite Richard, if he's still around, to come up as well. Hi, Frank. How are you? You're I am fantastic. After that speech and uh, that discussion, you are extraordinary. I am oh, so, thank you. so, so grateful to have popped into this room. Oh, thanks, Frank. Uh, this was an extraordinary room. I appreciate it. You're welcome. And I wanted to introduce Sky Nelson and Christine Eagleson and Sue Wilkinson, who um, are extraordinary people in their own right. Sky was um, leading a room on quantum physics, and he writes books on time. What is time? So I've invited him to come participate and give feedback and reactions. And Christine works with me. She is a performer, like opera singer, event organizer, uh, you know, art director, magazines, model, but she also is an intuitive. So she can feel and sense and translate the energy in the universe. And Sue also can do this. And she also is helping me with the Universal Peace Sanctuary in creating music concerts um, and many more. So I'm going to, let Sky actually give some reactions and add anything to what I said. Thanks, Peggy. It's great to be here. So I have a master's in physics from San Francisco State University. And um, I really aligned with a lot of what you said. So let me give you a little bit about my background. Um, I became interested in synchronicity as a phenomenon, as maybe a bridge point between the world of, you know, the outer world where we're, we're creating things and building businesses and running political campaigns and, and the inner world where we're learning how to be more mindful and more aware of our emotions, our emotional state. And so uh, believing that we can develop us uh, an understanding of that phenomenon, that, that it's, a real, it's a real bridge point. So uh, my, my means to do that is through a paper with the, what I've published recently is a paper called Space Time Pads as a Whole which is essentially um, developing the notion of holism, that, that time can be seen from a holistic perspective. And this is, a, this is really, I think, an important part of developing a science of synchronicity because although it's obviously controversial, it's a way of seeing time, not just as this single moment, 
but as part of a journey from the past to the future. It's extended from, from the past to the future and we're on it. So we experience it at a single moment right now. But it is part of something that's going somewhere. It has momentum. And the more we can understand the momentum that we have, the, the types of choices we're making, the meaning of those choices, where those choices lead, you know, are we, are we thinking about the impact of um, whether we recycle plastic or not? With the policy decisions we make now and where they lead momentum, where, what momentum they lead us toward in the future. And my assessment of synchronicity is that it allows uh, future results, future endpoints to influence or uh, ret retroactively determine what happens in the present to allow us to uh, experience those things. So synchronicities are events that don't make a lot of sense in the present moment, but they come together and make a lot of sense soon. And if you're experiencing something that, uh, you know, a coincidence that seems unusual, uh, maybe you don't have all the information yet about how that's going to be useful. And my view of that is that it, it can be really transformational. I see synchronicity as a, uh, a technology of human beings. And when we become aware of the way that we can um, be more at peace with ourselves, be more at peace with our environment, because we sort of expect that uh, this process of synchronicity or getting into flow will bring us the solutions we need, then we, we less and less um, come, come at odds with each other along that journey. There's less conflict. I, less, I don't need to get what I need from you specifically, but we can work together collaboratively on the journey to uh, develop what we need without the interpersonal conflicts. So I see synchronicity as a way and means of really addressing interpersonal conflicts that I think are at the center of human insecurity right now. So I really appreciate what you've brought up and emotions really a central piece of that. Um, I'll quote Aristotle for a moment here. Aristotle said, it's, it's easy to be angry. Anybody can do that. But to be angry at the right person, at the right time, for the right reason, in the right way, and to the right extent, that's really hard. And so the more we can understand the impact of our emotions on our choices and the way that we are affecting each other through improperly directing our emotions at people at the wrong time, I think we can start to use our anger or our emotions, our, our motivation, our, um, all the things we feel properly to build, but not to get in the way, not, not, to, not to undermine political negotiations or business deals or not to be unethical, but to become really honest and um, connected to each other so that we can really build together. So I really appreciate what you said about um, emotions and the, the importance of being transparent. And I think to maybe to close, I'll say that self-love and self-care is really the, the centerpiece of how I think we change our relationship to our emotions and become more skillful at building together. So oh. where my question to you is around, you know, how, how did you develop an awareness of the importance of emotional um, intelligence in interactions in business or in, in politics? And how did you develop the skills to do that? Okay, first, I want to make two remarks um, that I think Christine can rip off. One is, is that um, time is a two way street. So the, you know, cause and effect is a two way street. Uh, to your point that future can affect the now and the past, so to speak, there's, there's the past us, the now us and the future us that all now moments, they actually exist. So the way that I look at time um, is if you look at a hair comb standing on end and where the spine of this hair comb, then each um, reality is a, a spine or a time, and then it becomes time space. Uh, and so all of these are realities that exist at any now moment on the vertical edge of this comb. So the, the trick is how do you jump from one time to another? And uh, it, and, and that is the trick that I told you, which is to imagine the world that you want or jump into the future in great detail and then to fill it with the emotion of bliss, of awe, euphoria, ecstasy, because that's a really, really high vibration. That's the vibration of creation, right? High, 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 high. So you, you don't want to yeah. be angry. So one, I just wanted to confirm that. And I know Christine probably has a lot to say about that. I'm trying to think what was the second thing. Oh, so so basically it, to affect um, any 
now moment again they exist at any now moment so you you that that is a little bit of the an insight about how you can how you can choose um which reality that you want to jump to and then there's like probability of which realities uh you're going to jump to next like a monkey can only jump you know to the, the trees next to it versus way way over there the other side of the forest so in terms of emotional intelligence um you know honestly i think a lot of people who are very empathic or sensitive have suffered some sort of ostracizing so for me i was the first person of chinese descent from china to taiwan who was born in the us in my family and you know i didn't speak english as my first language my teachers sent me to speech therapy because of my accent they didn't realize it was an accent versus i had some sort of speech you know impediment <laughs> it's like i'm crazy <laughs> laughing and um you know there was a lot of racism i suffered a lot of racism a lot a lot and you know in greenwich connecticut i think i was six asians out of 2200 kids in high school out of three classes and so you know the chinese the chinese chinese culture is 180 degree opposite of american culture i mean literally 180 degree opposite of american culture and so i literally felt like i was a schizophrenic you know person jumping from one universe to another like if you say there's multiple realities it's not that far away from my reality living here in china and then being an american um they're two different planets literally i'm not exaggerating and so i don't know where i'm going with this i got a little distracted by politics what was i saying <laughs> very fre frequency of location being different dimensional energies oh my god well forget that i'm just, i'm too distracted because like oh what's going on let me just tell you that you know in a non dual world all of us are needed we're all notes uh on a key of a, a piano was it a what do you call the thing sorry yeah. you know yeah and that, that you know i think that we can we each we we have the technology of human um empath empathy and compassion and um oh that's what we're talking empathy. about emotion and empathy right and i i got all riled up i got emotional sky <laughs> i got emotional but anyway i think um being compassionate for the other side is what develops empathy i think Okay. So yeah, yeah. I Christina, I'm sure you have something to I'm sure you have the gazillion things thoughts running through. Right. So I'm going to hand it to you. Hi. Hi guys. <laughs> I do. I have a gazillion and five probably thoughts. Uh I love the excitement and like the uh the acuity that's going on in this space is really beautiful and uh, Sky I would like to acknowledge you're talking about synchronization and that in synchronization the construct around that something may occur but you may not be able to have a uh you know a particular place right a location in which to file that information where you know you can kind of come back to it later that it will be useful um but that is really a representation of one nonlinear time of course but two really getting into abundance because abundance is um you know often gets used especially lately in, in terminology around like money and finance and abundant and having like a lush sort of life type of thing but abundance is really a particular frequency uh and it actually is what is unconditional love because as Peggy's talking about when you move out of non-duality you're also moving out of uh you're moving out of time as linear and in timelessness and in timelessness and that abundance that high frequency of unconditional love is actually where we know that there is a constant return there is a constant need we get out of scarcity mentality so the non-dualism as peggy said everyone is relevant everyone is needed there is no such thing as uh not good enough or not working or you know some something or someone that gets shoved to the side when we get ourselves out of the frequency of that energy and move towards the unconditional love abundance because they are in fact one of the same then we get into potentiality infinite potentiality of everything in a multi-dimensional reality and uh 
it's super exciting because there's about a bazillion <laughs> examples I could cite here, but I don't, I don't really want to derail. Um, I, I just love what's going on. I just wanted to acknowledge uh, the tethering in that around um, synchronicity really taps into the abundance, unconditional love frequency, which means that when uh, a good example of is like the give a dollar, get a dollar kind of idea that it's like, if you're willing to give freely, you don't necessarily expect that that object or that thing or that action is a transactional and will come back directly to you in an exact form in which you expect, but you trust and know that somehow this effort, this intention is energetically echoed elsewhere and then will return to you usually more than twofold, but you have to get into that frequency of letting go and being within the flow of the inertia in order to facilitate that beautiful harmonic reverberation. I just wanted to show the people on Zoom um, that we're on Clubhouse as well. And so the people that are talking and you can't see them are on this uh, app. And there's about 96 people in the room right now from all over the world. So wow. if you awesome. haven't gotten on Clubhouse yet, just let me know. I can send you an invite if you're on I'm iPhone. Pre I'm pretty certain that uh, on the MIT side, all this spiritual quantumness is spinning everybody into an infinite loop because we don't know. <laughs> we've never seen these two worlds collide like this. <laughs> um, but, but the two worlds are absolutely singular and that's where we have the distortion and that we are that they are separate that science and religion are separate or that sciences and spirituality or essence or energy are singular but we're all made of electricity and made of water and if we understand electricity from a scientific point of view and we can imbue that and understanding how that works in the physical body then we're able to then connect that to how energy quote unquote spirituality connects to everything and that beyond hey, can i make a brief comment about the connection between the two um, this is Guy. And, you know, quantum mechanics is a, is a complicated subject, and it's, it, it brought in an, an unavoidable question about what is the role of systems uh, in observing other systems. And we've tried in various ways to understand that and to interpret it. Um, and it hasn't been resolved in a, in a way that, you know, that satisfies folks who are materialists. So there's this element of um, questioning materialism that is essential in quantum mechanics and, and, and remains there. Um, one of the, th there are enough open questions in quantum mechanics in my view and the foundations of, of the theory that uh, we don't know exactly um, the, the extent of it. And I will, uh, in, in some of my work, I point out that uh, the, the work that's been done for like um, decoherence theory to, to distinguish between the classical and the quantum world is based on an assumption that there is a classical and a quantum world. We introduce an, an objective environment to which everything um, collapses so that we actually, we, we do that in order to match our expectation that that's the way the world appears. But if you, if you reason it out um, a little bit further, you, know, you realize that when you observe a quantum system, you, you never actually see a, an, a, an atomic system in a superposition of states. You always observe it in a definite state. And in the same way, We've never observed a macroscopic item in a, in a superposition of states. Um, so we've never actually observed that quantum mechanics doesn't apply to the macroscopic world, but it is very much in alignment with what we, what, uh, it, how it appears. And so I take some of these issues and I, I, I do question um, that they are completely closed and, and, and we do need to have um, some open mind about them. Sky, I'd love for you to repeat what you said the other day about the, what is the many worlds theory and this Schrodinger's cat. But I've, first, I want to read Carl Chang's remark on Zoom. And he says, the concept of the dreaming realization is very much part of old Chinese culture. I have many of the same experiences of living in a bicultural glass house. I had the experience in founding Verifone and helped write the Hawaii State Energy Plan back in 1978. Yay, go Carl. Okay, Sky. That's awesome. Uh, so, well, I think what's interesting, you know, the many worlds theory is the least complicated version of quantum mechanics, which basically says you have the basic postulates of quantum mechanics of steady evolution of a system into all the different possible outcomes. But there's no sense in which it ever collapses to one of them. So all of them survive. All the, every time you interact with the system, 
you, you branch into, it's like a tree that divides. And what we assume in you know, everyday life is that you collapse that tree every time you observe something so that you only observe one branch. And um, that is obviously the reality we experience because we only ever experience one version of reality. But the, quant the, the many worlds hypothesis is essentially saying there is no collapse. There's no, we don't need to add that idea, that mechanism separately. Um, what, what, so what remains is this, this information about all the different possible um, versions of reality that it could unfold. What I think is important too, is that even among people in the field who study it, there is sort of this um, unresolved and, uh, and largely undiscussed sense and uh, or tension around you know, people who, who understand or believe that quantum mechanics is universal, that it applies universally, but then they, they don't quite, they, they certainly don't say that it applies to macroscopic objects. And um, these issues are so complex and so um, uh, esoteric that they led to the, the reason that people eventually took up the mantra, shut up, shut up and calculate, where we don't actually talk about these issues. Uh, in 1960, under the radar, uh, a physicist named Bell developed a way to test some of these more esoteric issues. And since then, they've been doing experiments that have gotten more and more precise and, and easy to run. And it's very much a part of the mainstream now that these, these esoteric issues are, are a part of experimental science. Um, but still, there's a resistance to looking at the underlying um, understanding of what quantum mechanics means. We focus really on the calculations and we can do ever more precise, you know, calculations for the, the particle colliders. And, you know, that, that convinces a lot of people that, that that's the whole story. But there are these unanswered questions about, for instance, what is time? What is the, the underlying nature of time? So there, there, I think there's, there's these underlying questions that we, um, we shouldn't assume are actually answered yet. And for those of you who are interested in these types of topics, do follow me, Peggy Liu, on Clubhouse with the bell and always, and also Christine and I talk a lot with uh, a man named Brian the Healer um, and other intuitives about this sort of more spiritual side of things and how time works. So we will leave that to another time. <laughs> That's awesome. So uh, <laughs> leave time to another time. I'm not going to let you get away with that. <laughs> In the future of the past. So I think I'm going to have Wayne on our side kind of provide an announcement because on the MIT side, we do have MIT staff that are like overseeing this. So we want to, the MIT side will probably log off this clubhouse and after this part. So, but then the clubhouse yes. part should continue. <laughs> yes. yes, we'll keep on clubhouse after this. And how many more minutes did you want to go on the Zoom side just so we can do a time check? Oh, um, so I think Winking has a few more, a few words to say to just help close out and then we'll, we'll sign out. The, so we'll, okay. we'll literally close okay. out within the next three minutes. And thank you so much, Humphrey. My friend Humphrey <laughs> well, Moana, Moana is also on the, on the, uh, thank you, Moana. Can you show your face, Moana? Oh, not to put you on the spot. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, I saw it, I saw it. <laughs> All right, cool. Um, and then Winking, if you can say a few words too. And thank you, Peggy and Humphrey, for an interesting talk. And thank you, audience, for joining in. We hope that you have enjoyed this webinar. Uh, for MIT alumni and students, please join us. The MIT Chinese alumni group, our link is in the chat. I hope you can see that. And my name is Winking Wong. I'm the group founder and leader. My LinkedIn address is in the chat too. Please send me your feedback and your email address if you want to be connected to our email list. Thank you and have a great year. Goodbye. I love your background. <laughs> All right. Thank you. thank you, Humphrey, and yes, thank you, thank, Mona. Thanks so much, Peggy, and uh, great meeting the team. I'm, I'm, I'm following you in Clubhouse, and I'm going to um, broaden my spiritual horizons. <laughs> and and uh, I, I, I have to dig deeper into this spiritual quantumness. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely for sure. I'm on uh, Clubhouse a lot. Shanghai Peggy, Peggy Lou. There's too many Peggy Lou, so it's Peggy Lou, but Shanghai Peggy. I also blog mostly on Facebook, um, but I'm also on Instagram.
Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, but I don't, I don't love to talk on those platforms. You're, you're welcome to connect with me. Yeah. And um, yeah, I'll see you at MIT. All right. Yes. Thanks everyone for uh, joining us on the MIT side and uh, we'll see you at the next MIT Chinese alumni group event.